over the next quarter of an hour or so, we are going to immerse ourselves in a revolution. A revolution with profound consequences for ourselves, our systems and our civilization. And this revolution isn't about digitization or globalization or disruptive innovations or any of the other macro trends that futurists tend to point to. No. In fact, this revolution isn't out there at all. It's in here, in our own hearts and minds. It's a revolution in consciousness, from separateness to connectedness, that is ripping up the rule book about how we view life and our sense of place and purpose within it. So let's cut to the chase. Myriad disciplines at the forefront of Western science, such as quantum physics, depth psychology, facilitation ecology, neurobiology, many areas are discovering with increasingly sophisticated instruments and experiments, we are proving the innate weave and weft of this world, the innate interrelationality of this reality. And of course, this discovery isn't new. It's as fresh as it is ancient, because it resonates with the timeless wisdom of prophets, philosophers, seers and shamans throughout the ages who have long understood this innate interrelationality of life. But today we're proving it with our reductive experiments, and it has the potential to change everything. Because still today, we are largely caught up in a worldview that is rooted in separation competition, control, and domination. Still today, we serve up to our children in our schools, to our adults in our business schools, a recipe of neo-Darwinism that views life through threat-tinted glasses, separate species struggling for survival in a dog-eat-dog -dog world. The whole process of evolution, seen through this lens of selfish ascendancy, the unit of evolution, the selfish gene within us. And this is a deeply divisive logic, and it's woefully inadequate, and yet it underpins much of our socio-economic thinking in business, politics, and beyond. This illusion of separation that we've created in our own minds is castrating us from nature, from our deeper human nature, from each other, and from the world around us. It creates what Albert Einstein insightfully referred to as an optical delusion of consciousness, which creates increasing fear, anxiety, egotism, individualism, and consumerism. It's this flawed worldview, this flawed way of attending, which is actually at the heart of our challenges today. And yet so often, whilst trying to find solutions to this trilemma of social, economic and environmental crises now upon us, we apply the very same level of consciousness that created our problems in the first place to our well-intended solutions. We simply don't have time for this anymore. This is humanity's hour of reckoning. We need to get radical and deal with the root cause, which is this flawed way of attending. The good news is, as I say, at the forefront of myriad disciplines in Western science, we are exploring just this. We are dispelling this illusion of separation so that we can sense into the deeper connectedness of our humanity in this more than human world. So let me give you some examples now to bring this alive. Let's take a tree. Let's say an English oak tree in an English woodland. Using our old neo-Darwinian logic, this oak tree would at best be interested in its genetic offspring, the acorn. But now we know, with our radioactive tracings and so forth, we can show that the tree is sharing nutrients with a holly sapling in a different part of the forest. Areas rich in minerals are sharing with areas poor in minerals. And we really struggle to understand what's going on when we apply this old logic. Take you and I, here today. We now know that at least 90% of the cells in our bodies aren't even human. Without the help of these non-human cells, you and I would utterly fail at life. 
And when we drill down and look at one of these cells, we see that it's surrounded by a semi-permeable membrane, continuously interrelating with its environment. In fact, the more we look, the more we see that everywhere this interrelationality is a hallmark property of life. In fact, hardline definitive boundaries of complete separation simply don't exist anywhere except in our own minds. Assumptions of convenience that we've created to help us make sense of, atomize, compartmentalize, categorize, and objectify the world around us. Now this way of attending, this ability to objectify and abstract and define, is an important part of what makes us human. We need it. Unless these definitions begin to tyrannize over us to such an extent that they actually desensitize us from the very world we're trying to make sense of. So let's drill down even further in the cell and look at the genes within the cell. Not these units of selfish ascendancy, as neo-Darwinism would have us believe. What we actually find are dynamic localities, learning, participating with our environment. What we thought was 97% junk DNA, we now realize is continuously interrelating at local and non-local levels with its environment, transforming our view of metagenetics. Drill down even further into the cell, and you come across the atoms and subatomic particles within the cell. Not the hard, massy, impenetrable objects of Newtonian physics, no. What we actually find are quark strings, vibrations of light, each humming away to their own unique tune. It's amazing. It's awe-inspiring. At the most fundamental level, what we find are these electromagnetic vibrations of light are immersed within an all-pervasive sea, an ocean. What scientists call the quantum vacuum, the zero-point energy field, the ground of all being. And for many of these scientists that sense into this, they have mystical experiences. For instance, David Bohm, brilliant, first-rate British scientist, sensed into the formlessness that informs all form. Now, a metaphor might be useful here to help convey this. So let's take the wave on the ocean. Each wave has its own form, its own fingerprint, if you like. No two waves are ever the same. But the wave is never separate from the ocean. And that's the same for these electromagnetic vibrations that make up the appearance of matter to our senses. They are immersed in this ocean of interbeing. We are immersed in this ocean of interbeing. And what's really interesting is that we can now show, with our increasingly sophisticated instruments and experiments, we can prove what happens when we shift our consciousness from a state of separateness, self as separate from and in competition with the world, to a state of connectedness, of opening up to this ground of being through contemplative and embodiment practices. We see what happens. Physiologically and psychologically, we change. Tissue repair rates improve. Stem cell reproduction improves. Hormones change. Senses liven. The synaptial connections in our brain enhance Brainwave frequencies change. The left and right brain hemispheres interrelate more readily. The head, the heart, and the gut entrain. We become more human. Our ability to empathize and see different perspectives increases. Our ability to sense into subtly lit, synchronistic pathways in our midst all enhances. Our ability for compassion, wisdom, and intuition all improves. The very qualities that we need to lead and change and adapt in these times of fast-moving volatility all come on stream. And my work is mainly in business. And in the corridors of power, corporate boardrooms and conference halls that I speak and advise at, I sense winds of change blowing through, challenging the structures and strictures by which we operate and organize. And now I'd like to share with you how this revolution in consciousness is manifesting in business. Perhaps the most powerful human creative force on the planet today. Essentially what we're seeing is a shift in perspective. 
from viewing the organisation as a machine, top-down, hierarchic, siloed, sweating its assets for short-term returns, one of those assets being human resources, to realising the organisation is actually a living system, a living system that interrelates, intimately interrelates with the living systems of society, which intimately interrelate with the living systems of our more than human world. Now that's quite a big shift for how we lead and operate. And the good news is we can take inspiration from living systems within us and all around us to help us with this shift. There's much that we can learn from nature these days to help our organisations become more future fit. And I'll share with you now one key principle, which is that of divergence and convergence. So divergence is opening up and convergence is binding together. And out of that tension comes the third, which is emergence, the way in which we find our flow, the way in which we become more of who we are. We find our niche in an ever-changing ecosystem. We realise our evolutionary potential. Really important. And what we now know, what helps our organisations become more resilient, more vibrant, more future fit in these times of volatility, is that we need to encourage that divergence. Encourage that divergence through decentralised decision making. Distributed decision making that empowers teams to make change happen at the local level. So they can locally attune to the ever-changing environment without having to rely on hierarchies of bureaucracy and control. And that divergence also comes with diversity. Celebrating diversity. Not just in terms of age, creed, culture and gender, as important as that is in the workplace, but also in terms of perceptual horizon, how we see things, bringing different people from different parts of the silos in the business, so those silos permeate more readily, bringing different people from different parts of the stakeholder ecosystem, so that organisational membrane permeates more readily. And that divergence needs to be balanced with a convergence, otherwise the organisation becomes too amorphous, too chaotic. And that convergence has traditionally come through power-based hierarchies of control and domination. Now there's a whole philosophic and historic reason for that. Born out of a militarised mind, rising patriarchy, the ego explosion, culminating in this scientific revolution with its focus on rationalism and materialism which still underpins so much of our scientific management theory in business today. And there's really useful aspects in that that we need going forward, certainly. But as a dominant paradigm, it's unfit for purpose for the world that we're now in. And what we're now seeing is that convergence is being replaced with a resonant sense of purpose. And we can enhance this resonant sense of purpose when a threshold of people within the organisation deeply resonate with the organisation's sense of purpose. And some sociological studies show us that that can be as little as 10% of people in the organisation. When they deeply resonate with that organisational sense of purpose, a tipping point is reached, a threshold is crossed, whereupon the consciousness of the organisation comes alive and it becomes easier for us to let go of those power-based hierarchies of control or run them in parallel and allow more self-organising, more emergent, more empowering and more human ways of operating. But what's really interesting is what we can see to deepen this resonance in times of fast-moving change, the organisational sense of purpose needs to touch our humanity as meaning-seeking, purposeful creatures that we are. And so the organisational sense of purpose needs to be more than maximising profits or becoming number one in the marketplace. What we're realising is that sense of purpose needs to be about enhancing life, creating the conditions conducive for life to flourish, leaving the garden richer than we found it, improving society, the environment and the economy. And that's why we now see in business these four Ps. Purpose, people, planet, profit. Profit flows from that purpose, not the other way around. And this isn't some kind of utopian dream, some nice-to-have vision to be attained with in times of plenty but discarded as soon as the going gets tough. No. 
What we're now realizing is this is core. This is essential to what enables our organizations to become future fit, to thrive in these times of increased volatility. And we can see this manifesting in business right before our very eyes now with the exponential growth of movements such as the purpose movement, teal evolutionary, conscious capitalism, B Corps. Let's take B Corps for instance as an example. Started off with a handful of mission driven businesses in North America, now over 2,000 organizations around the world signing up to change their legal constitution voluntarily, away from short-term returns for shareholders, to creating value for all stakeholders, including society and the environment. And not seeing this as some kind of moral burden or duty, but realizing this creates the very vitality, the very purposeful, mission-driven, entrepreneurial, creative life force that the organization needs to thrive in these times of fast-moving change. And so it's a very exciting time to be involved in the future of business. And so I'll finish on a quote from the well-respected business futurist, John Naisbitt, who says that the greatest breakthroughs of the 21st century will not occur because of technology. They will occur because of an expanding concept of what it means to be human. Now, I love that to be involved in this expanding concept of what it means to be human, to help us human beings live up to our name as homo sapiens, wise beings, in this deeply wise, interconnected and sentient world. Thank you very much.